We're going to study this morning from John chapter 14 and a little bit from chapter 15. If you'd be opening your Bibles there. When you start paying attention, careful attention, to what occupied Jesus' mind, what filled his prayers, and what animated his conversations with his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion, well, you find that you're digging in a deep mine that's full of everything that matters most. Jesus is a powerful being, and the most thoughtful of all souls. And these are the things that were on his mind, in his prayers, and in his conversations when he knew that he was going to die within hours. That makes them very, very important. The events of that night in the Gospel of John are recorded in chapters 13 through 18, and in those chapters, Jesus does most of the talking. And as elsewhere in the Bible, whenever deity is communicating, it's mostly about who Jesus is and what he does, who his Father is and what he does, who the Holy Spirit is and and what he does. And that, like the rest of the Bible, gives the background for why you and I should be and do what God wants us to be and to do. When Jesus starts talking about, in John 13 through 18, what his disciples at that time and we should be and do, he says that we ought to serve one another, we ought to love each other, we ought to believe, we ought to abide in him and bear much fruit, we ought to remember, we ought to pray. Right in the middle of all of that, he pinpoints first the motivation for Christian living and church life, and then the standard for Christian living and church life. Let's read about it in a few selected verses in John 14 and and 15. First of all, John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then let's read verses 21 through 24. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now across the page, chapter 15, verses 10 through 14. Jesus is still speaking, and he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now back to that very first verse that we read, John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Or if you love me, you will obey what I command. When you're talking with someone about Christian life, or about Jesus, or about the church, how soon does the word love enter the conversation? If you want people to know what you know about Jesus, if you want people to understand the life that you're trying to live, if you want people to understand what we're all about as a church, how soon do they hear the word love roll off your lips? I am what I am, I do what I do, because I love the Lord. We are who we are, we do what we do, because we love Jesus Christ. We love because He first loved us, 1 John 4 verse 19 says. The Bible in the New Testament in its first four books offers us four 
complementary pictures of the life of Jesus on earth. Four paintings of his character. If you read carefully the Gospel of Matthew, you're bound to love Jesus. If you read attentively all the way through the Gospel of Mark, you'll love Jesus more. And if you open up the Gospel of Luke and read every word, paying careful attention all the way to the end, you'll love Jesus yet more. And if you open the Gospel of John and read from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end of chapter 21, you're going to love Jesus yet more. You're going to see a life like no other. You're going to read as you're going through the Gospel of John that Scripture that's among the best known of all to the world. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You get that impression of God. And then as you see God walking and talking among people in Jesus, you're impressed by His care, by His compassion, by His concern for people. And you're drawn to Him. And you want to be like Him. The keen sense of the love of God through Jesus Christ breeds love in us. Here in John chapter 14, Jesus wants us to see that the motivation for Christian life and for church life is love. Love is the motivation... And obedience is the standard of Christian life and church life. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll obey what I command. Love makes you want to do what Jesus did and and to do what Jesus says to do. In his case, here's what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 31. But I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. As the Father has commanded me. He said, that's what I do. But it's a little stronger than that, as the Father commanded me. The Greek word kathos is there, as the Father commanded me. But some of our translations say, just as the Father has commanded me. The New American Standard Bible and the New International Version say exactly what God has commanded me. There's something to that word. Jesus said, I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Why? Because I love Him. And because I want the world to know that I love the Father. Now, those of us who are reading this book through the week and recommitting ourselves to God's purposes for His church saw Tim Alsop's explanation on page 166. He quoted, But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. John 14, 31. And then Tim wrote, Jesus' love for the Father produced the goal of doing exactly, notice that word, as the Father commanded. Jesus didn't want to do sort of what the Father commanded or most of what the Father commanded. He wanted to do exactly what the Father commanded. Was Jesus being legalistic or trying to be better than everyone else? Of course not. It came from where he said it came from, showing the world how much he loved the Father. Now, is there anything bad about Jesus' motivation, love? Is there anything wrong with Jesus' standard, determined obedience? Nothing at all wrong with Jesus' motivation or standard. That motivation is absolutely right. That standard is absolutely right. And the right way for all the rest of us to be right is to share Jesus' motivation and Jesus' standard. Love and obedience. Now, how will that affect our thinking and behavior? If we have Jesus' motivation and we have Jesus' standard, it won't leave us languishing over here thinking about what are the minimum requirements. 
Instead, it'll push the needle over here toward maximum effort. What does God want me to think? What does God want me to say? What does God want me to do? Well, that's what I want to think. That's what I want to say. That's what I want to do because I love Him so much. Jesus' kind of love is is more than feeling something. Jesus' kind of love is more than words that you would say. It's no less than aiming to please the God who loves us in every way possible. Why wouldn't we want to if we love Him? Besides being right, loving obedience to God is being close to Him. Let's go back to verses 21 to 24, John 14, and notice what Jesus says is the outcome of loving and obeying. He says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So I said being obedient, lovingly obedient to God is how we're right with God, but it's also how we're close to God. And notice that Jesus connects two things there in verse 21, but he also distinguishes them. Having the commandments, and keeping the commandments. Not enough people know what Jesus says today. And then, lots more people know what Jesus says to do than do what Jesus says to do. One woman wrote about what she witnessed in the living room in her daughter's house. Her granddaughter, three-year-old Beverly, was over here on one side of the room playing with her toys. On the other side of the room was her mother, and she was folding laundry. Mother noticed that Beverly's shirt was dirty and and needed to be changed, and and so she uh, called two times to her with no response. Beverly, come over here and let me change your shirt. Beverly, come over here and let me change your shirt. Well... Beverly didn't do anything about that. So uh, finally, Beverly got the full three-name call. Beverly Elizabeth Provost, come over here and let me change your shirt. Did you hear me? And Beverly answered, well, my ears heard you, but my feet didn't hear you. Jesus knows that sometimes our, our ears hear him, but our feet don't hear him. Our ears hear Him, but our hands don't hear Him. Our ears hear Him, but our mouths don't hear Him. You have the commandments. You keep the commandments, Jesus said. That's love. And if you love Jesus, you keep His commandments, and Jesus says that keeps you close to Him. Now, this other Judas... Not Iscariot, not the one who would betray Jesus in a few hours. Judas, who's maybe Thaddeus in the other Gospels. Judas was thinking, well, aren't you going to display, manifest yourself to the whole world in all your glory as the Messiah? And that's what Jews were expecting from someone who's the Christ, who's the Messiah. Just an overwhelming move from him, to convince the whole world, to convict the whole world, to to lead the whole world. Instead, the Messiah wants to make himself at home with loving, obedient people, Jesus said. Whoever loves me, whoever obeys me, my Father will love him. I will love him. We will make our home with him. That's about being close to God. It's not a a mystical presence, but it's, like we sing, a blessed assurance that comes from the promise that Jesus made. 
I will dwell with the person who loves me and keeps my commandments. God loves the whole world, John 3, 16. But this is on beyond that. It's something close and great. So besides being right, loving obedience makes us close to God. And in the third sense, it, it's what makes us happy in Christ. With the happiest happiness there is. Now that's what we picked up additionally from chapter 15, verses 10 through 14. Jesus is talking about keeping His commandments and abiding in His love. And in verse 11, He says, These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And then he would say in verse 14 that if you love me and keep my commandments, you're my friend. You're my friend. I read that, and I just cannot believe that God is holding out on us. That those things that God forbids would really make us happier than life with God can make us. That those things that God says are off limits are really better for us than what He has to offer us. 1 John chapter 5 verse 3 says that this is love for God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. It's not God's mission to make life miserable for you. It's not God's will to make everything harder for you. Jesus wants you to have His joy in you. And He wants your joy to be full. And He assures us that that comes from loving Him and keeping His commandments. Do you really believe that? People who lovingly obey Jesus are going to be the happiest people in the world, in the best sense of happiness. The joy that Jesus has and the joy that Jesus gives They don't have a little bit of Jesus in their life. He is everything. As we sing in another old song, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You might be one of those people who's standing there in a middle ground. Well, you're not a worldly person, you don't think, trying to totally ignore Jesus and find all your own pleasure in life. You're right here. But are you a person who's trying to have a little bit of Jesus in life because you know you're supposed to? Or is Jesus everything in your life? And that shapes everything else. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Now, you can be baptized into Christ and and you can feel a, a strong commitment at that point, but you can start backing up from it, and you can keep going through some of the motions, but you're not going to be happy in Jesus. You're not going to have the joy in you that He wants you to have from Him and and have it to the full. That comes from lovingly obeying Him. You know, sometimes lessons that we preach and teach here aim at building love for the Lord. We'll focus on Jesus, like if if we get to do this in a couple of weeks, and we see who's Jesus in Matthew, who is He in Mark, who is He in Luke, who is He in John. That's going to be about building faith and love in Jesus. That's what it will all be about. But more often, we assume that the people who are gathered here already love Jesus, And so we talk about what is it to obey Jesus then? What does Jesus want me to know? And what does Jesus want me to do? Now, if you don't already love the Lord, maybe most of our lessons are not exactly about that when it's all Christians together, but if you don't already love the Lord, then there is going to be a big disconnect for you when we're talking about how do I obey the Lord. You don't have much motivation to obey the Lord. You don't love Him. And so that might make church really boring for you. If you find it a real drag, let me say, it might not be church. It might not be what's going on here. It might be a problem in your heart. 
you just don't love the Lord enough to be eager to hear, what does He want me to do? And how can I do it better than I'm already doing it? But more positively, your love for the Lord could be the reason for the disconnect there is and that you feel whenever you are trying to talk to somebody in the world or somebody of some other religious persuasion, but you don't seem to connect. That could be because you've moved further. You're thinking on a different plane. You're living on a different plane than they are. You really love the Lord. And to you, that means what Jesus says it means. You want to obey Him with all your being. Now, the people that you're talking to, probably to this point, don't want to obey Him with all of their being. They want to fulfill some of the desires of the flesh more than they want to express love by obeying Jesus. Their focus is over here on minimum requirements. Yours is on maximum effort. And that's why you have trouble getting on the same page. Be patient. Be persistent. Your aim, like Jesus, to do exactly as God commands you may be the real window for that person into love for the Lord. Be like Jesus. Jesus says that the motivation of Christian life and church life is love. And the standard of Christian life and church life is obedience. John chapter 14, verse 15, is a very easy verse to get to stick up here. If you haven't already memorized it, how about not in this day without doing so? It's easy. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Or if you love me, you will obey what I command. It's short and to the point. It ought to be committed to every memory. It ought to be written on every heart. It ought to be a daily inspiration to do right, and it ought to be a ready defense against temptation to do wrong. It's a guiding star for the church. If you love me, you will obey what I command. As we finish this morning, I ask you, do you love him? Do you love Jesus? If you do, then I know you want to obey what I command. When I say that, I mean what He commands. If you haven't heard before, Jesus wants someone like you who believes in Him to repent of sin. Totally. Change your mind about your direction in life and about who or what rules in your life. Be sorry for the things that you've done wrong and determined to do right in your heart and your mind. Jesus wants you to confess the faith that you have in Him. And Jesus wants you to be baptized. With all His authority, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Two disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus wants you to be baptized. Jesus wants to be with you the rest of your life, and He wants you to be with Him in eternal life. If you love Him, obey Him this morning. If you're a disciple, but you've not been the kind of disciple that you know a disciple ought to be, what you've been doing hasn't been coming from love, and love hasn't been motivating you to be as obedient as you ought to be, and you want to know you can be forgiven, and you want a church to encourage you. We want to pray for you this morning. You could be baptized. You could be the subject of our prayers. And we'd love for those things to happen. And you can come and, and let us know that desire while we stand and sing together.